Hello everyone, my name's Ella and welcome to 100 Stories Deep. Today I'm going to be reading a story called Kitchen Curse by Eka Kaneawan, which is from this collection of his short stories which goes by the same title. Um, I've chosen this story to share with you today because I like how it shows the importance of uncovering stories of resistance that are hidden from history and how they can be learned from to empower ourselves against injustices in the present. And this particular story, like all stories in the collection, is set in Indonesia. Kitchen Curse. Quote. And we shaded you with clouds and sent down to you manna and quails. End quote. Quran 257. Maharani went to the city archive, hoping to find some new recipe ideas. But this is what she found instead. Once upon a time, a bugis fishing boat capsized in an Atlantic storm and sunk. The sole survivor, a young man clutching a leather pouch stuffed with spices, was rescued by a Portuguese trading ship. He found the food on the ship torturously bland. On tasting it, he ran straight to the kitchen and revealed himself to be a master of flavour. That night, all the sailors on that vessel burnt their tongues, discovering a completely new sensation, one their ancestors had never known. Despite the fact he changed the course of history, out of all the history books and such like, there is only one single volume of Portuguese encyclopedia published in 1892, mentioning that man's name. We have forgotten this man to thank for the arrival of Western traders who came to buy those spices, bringing along the rats stowed away on their ships. That was the origin of European greed. In time, the Dutch brought their large companies here too, but truth be told, even as they aimed to dominate this entire archipelago, they could never master the spices they so craved. The story of Daya Ayu's dramatic rebellion, which I'm about to tell you, is authentic proof of that. Maharani was not a good cook. She had always felt cursed by her husband, forced to cower in the kitchen, and sometimes in the bedroom too. She'd never realised that she was living in a country God had created as a paradise for all things that bloom and grow, and she read on. Everything grows here, and almost all of it is edible. I say almost, because a few plants, if you eat them, will make you die an agonising death. But then again, if you are already dying an agonising death and you eat them, they might also save your life. These plants are our most well-kept secrets, guarded for centuries, passed down from one generation to the next. Even though, in truth, it happens all the time, to die of starvation in this country would be the stupidest thing imaginable. The forests are dense with trees whose fruit, leaves, bark and even sap can be consumed. There are farms. There are rivers and lakes and ponds where the fish are fruitful and multiply quicker than humans. How wide and deep is the ocean? This, too, is brimming with fish. The wild animals are as tame as doves. Just toss something onto the ground and it will take root and grow. If it isn't a dream come true, then this country surely must be a heaven on earth. Alfred Russell Wallace came here and was astonished by thousands of different species, living and dead. Eugene Dupois excavated fossils of extinct humanoids. But of course it was the Dutch merchants who calculated the immense profit to be made from this country so full of treasure. For years, all Maharani had known 
about was how to bear children and prepare a simple breakfast, lunch and dinner. Now she knew that Dutchmen had stayed in her country for more than three centuries. She continued. First, the Dutch established businesses and then they took over kingdoms. They sent a governor general who quickly put the machines of bureaucracy to work throughout the country. Magistrates, prefects and controllers. They subjugated small-time kings, turned them into district regents, and the regents subjugated the district officers, and the district officers subjugated the local headmen. The Dutch also controlled the Chinese merchants, who brought the right to collect taxes on all kinds of commodities sold at auction. Herbs, spices, livestock, salt and opium. And that was how business went in those days. We had to plant what they wanted and not plant what they didn't want. We made long roads, laid down train, train tracks and built ports because that was what they decreed. Then came the first of many things in this country. The first post offices, telegraphs, gas lamps, telephones and newspapers. Outside of this bureaucratic colonial machine, of course, other Europeans privately owned their plantations and their indigenous slaves. That whole situation set a good stage for native uprisings. Heroes were born and heroes fell. We already know about some of them because their portraits are painted in the murals that adorn our schools. But there are more. Unlike all those other famous fighters, one woman carried out her rebellion without any spears or bamboo spikes. Daya Ayu, the woman who made war from her very own kitchen. Maharani only knew a handful of seasonings and a few recipes she had learned from magazines. Now she was intrigued to hear that a woman could become a warrior by mastering spices. She continued to read. Who was that woman? A famous cook, she was a patriot fit to be idolised by school children. But what we think we know from the tales about her, perhaps heard for the first time in elementary school, is rubbish. Somehow the storytellers all spoke nonsense about her, as if merely drawing on their own imagination rather than from any accurate data, or as if there had been an effort to erase her from history, and though her memory had been salvaged, all that remained was a portrait of a woman who had never really existed. The figure of Daya Ayu became strange, melancholy and tragic. Legend tells us that her father sold her to a Dutch plantation owner who bought her for her beauty. But that's not true. She wasn't pretty at all, although the Dutch man did sleep with her a few times and she bore him two children. She was in fact bought for her extraordinary ability to oversee the seasoning, preparation, cooking and serving of delicious food. Another fabrication was that she secretly taught the servants how to read and write, and they taught others in the neighbouring households, until many native servants of the Dutch became educated, and then she organised them and led a rebellion on one unforgettable Thursday. That's false. Daya Ayu was illiterate. But she did teach the servants her kitchen secrets. Specifically, how to wield spices like weapons. To Dutch families living in the territories, a clever cook was not just a symbol of a family's wealth, but also a source of pride to be shown off at evening banquets. That is why it's unsurprising that native women, spice experts, often found themselves kidnapped, bought or sold. And even though their status in the family was never any higher than that of a concubine, the household would hold on to a talented cook at any cost. 
There were a number of reasons for this. First, Dutch women on colonial land, just like their men, enjoyed an opulence beyond their wildest dreams. They became lazy creatures, passing their time on verandas that looked out over the lush carpets of tea plantations, reading fashion magazines that had been sent straight from Paris. Second, even if a Dutch woman tried to learn the most treasured recipes, the real knockouts, she would never be able to actually cook them. Miss Catenius van der Moon tried it once, travelling around, visiting the families of famous cooks and writing down their recipes in notebook after notebook. The resulting cookbook looked splendid, but because she hadn't realised there were so many untold secrets that never made it onto the page, the recipes were not. Daya Ayu was one of the bearers of that clandestine knowledge. She could turn anything into a sumptuous meal or something else. Of course, these islands are teeming with wild edibles. Here, you can eat the stalks of banana trees and not just the bananas. You can eat young bamboo shoots and palm tree buds. Grasshoppers and moths and snails and frogs can all be cooked and served at the dining table. It's beyond obvious that in this country, no one has ever had to pray for manna, like the Israelites had to pray from God. But watch out, there are secrets hiding in our extravagant lunch menus. There are certain seeds of certain fruits that can dry you out until you're nothing but a crispy little chip, or even kill you in seven days if blended with vinegar and salt. There are secret mixtures hidden in the kitchen. Secret power lies in the hands of the women who grind spices and boil potatoes. Some of their dishes will be exquisite meals fit for the gods. Some will be miraculous healing medicines. And some will be merciless killers. And it is only those women, those cooks, who know the difference. Discovering all of this, Maharani felt really ashamed. She herself was certainly not the pride of her family kitchen. She grew all the more engrossed in the archive, hoping to find some more useful knowledge about seasonings that might improve her sense of self-worth. But instead, Maharani would soon learn how Daya Ayu, in her extraordinary wisdom, carried out her rebellion. She continued to read. She could blend a strange potion that would make a man impotent forever. And she used that one after the Dutchman gave her two children. In the next phase, she emboldened herself to prepare the most dangerous concoctions, those that could kill someone but make the death look natural. She chose her master's dinner guests as her first victims. Of course, she did this secretly, hiding the murderous mixtures in a vegetable curry. And in order to avoid suspicion, she used ingredients that only took effect a week or two after consumption. Her working methods were really quite extraordinary, and she was able to take down even more victims than those who had fell on the battlefield. One year after her first murder, she had already killed 52 pure-blooded Dutchmen. That was when the newspaper began to report the suspicious rise in the natural death rate around Batavia. Perhaps one or two of those dead men were not her victims, but it would be practically impossible to get a more accurate total. Her personal protests became truly terrifying when she taught the other servants the secrets of her kitchen. And in brief furtive meetings, those servants taught the servants in the neighbouring households. The kitchen secrets, which in previous generations had only been harboured by a select few, were suddenly shared by almost all the cooks in the city. 
It was Daya Ayu who turned spice into a murderous weapon. And it is true that she organised all those cooks in an awesome rebellion one fateful Thursday. The servants did rise up and kill their masters simultaneously, but not with their kitchen knives. They did it with mushroom soup. That was a very dark day indeed for the colonists. 142 pure-blooded Dutchmen died all at once. It happened in 1878. People already know enough about the end of Daya Ayu's life, so we won't go into it here. And if we got a few other details wrong, it doesn't really matter. One thing is for sure, the key to her method. And perhaps the real reason why she has been left out of the history books, although it probably sounds like an excuse for the sexist bent of history, was its subtlety and its flawless purity. Sure, others tried to copy her methods of putting arsenic in the food, for example, and poisoning people that way. But only Daya Ayu used everyday spices to cause natural seeming deaths. And that's why there has been so little mention of her in the official public record. Practically nothing left of her but misleading myths, vague memories. Today, this invisible history has been revealed to Maharani, and now she has the secrets of the kitchen in hand. She will go home from the city archive knowing how to kill her husband at the kitchen table. She will be free from the curse of the kitchen and the bed, and soon. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that story. Um, so I'm not trying to suggest that you should try and kill anyone with it, but um, maybe you could think about what your favourite spice is and how much do you know about its history. Um, if you don't know much, then why not do a little bit of digging around, um, thinking about how it has been grown and gathered throughout history, um, what have its different uses been by people over time. Um, also what country, what part of the world is it native to and how did it become accessible to places um, in other parts of the world. Okay, so um, please share your thoughts and findings in the comment section below and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to listen to and watch more stories from the 100 Stories Deep series. Okay, bye!